Thanks for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bill Hedinger. Um, Dr. Bill is an author, educator, and speaker on the subject of online education. He is a consultant to colleges and universities, corporate trainers, Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits, and individuals developing online courses. He has designed, created, and taught online and blended courses for numerous colleges and universities, and is the founder of Effective eLearning, where he develops and evaluates online courses and programs and consults on the use of technology in education and the business of education. Dr. Bill is also a professor of mine in a master's degree program. Um, I learned a lot from him, and I hope you all will find him uh, very informative and helpful today as well. So, without further ado, Dr. Bill, the e-learning guru. Wow. Well, I hope I can live up to that introduction. Yeah, somebody writes your bio, you're, you're always amazed you've actually done all of those things. Um, yeah, I guess, I, I was talking to Ryan, this, this book came out, uh, I got a copy of the book, yeah, I was going to leave some, some with the college, but this book came out back in August or so of this year, I think Ryan was a student at the time, and I probably did something like I brought the book into class and showed it to everybody, um, or I asked, asked him questions about it and then showed it to him, and he said, boy, boy that's good, we're, we're just getting into online at, at Capital, would you like to come down and do a kind of an in-service for us? And of course I said, yes, little did I know it was going to be the only day in February that didn't snow or something, <laughs> zero degrees out there. Um, I start off with, just to get a little bit, to, um, to kind of know a little bit about you. Who teaches online now? Who does not teach online? Who does not teach online but thinks they're headed in that direction? Okay. Um, I wanted to start off with just kind of a, a couple questions. I never, you know, Ryan will tell you I never do a, you're not going to get a, a, an hour lecture from me. Um, what frustrates you about teaching an online class? I mean, those who've taught online or those, those who haven't taught online but, but have heard about it, what, what, what's, what frustrations do you see? I miss the face-to-face, uh, -face, I'm a visual person, so I really miss having uh, groups of students in the classroom and having a, a, a very lively conversation. Well, I mean, can't, see the can't see the faces, can't see the people. I do a lot of discussion-based work in class, and it's, it's, I've found ways of replicating that online, but it's not as fulfilling. I think that's kind of similar to Nancy's. Right, so okay. The restriction that the platform sometimes impose on the teacher. The platform, yeah. I'm going to talk about platforms at the end of the day. I'm actually working on a white paper on that. Uh, engaging uh, some students because you can't see their, you know, you can't really uh, get to the conversation you need to sometimes. Right. Right. Okay. Engaging, getting the students in, getting, looking at their faces. Um, I get frustrated because I'm not good enough at the technology to make things more interesting than, than they sure. are. Yeah. I'd like them to be snazzier. I'd like to have more ability with video and things like that. I know what I can show in a classroom, but online it, I'm clueless about how to Okay, do okay, I'll talk about that as well. Sometimes students don't explain themselves they, when they, they're asking the question, and when I look at it and I interpret it, I go, you know, what is the student really asking? And mm -hmm. then I have to write that and then we play ping pong a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right, so you lost three days doing your question. It <laughs> would have taken five minutes in the classroom. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Um, the se second question I want to ask: um, are, are, you, are you programs? Are there programs here that are fully online pieces, or, or is it sort of a mix? A student can take whatever they want. It's a mix, it's a mix so it's not a fully online program. The next question I was going to ask sort of was: what's frustrating about an online program? Anybody? I'll get, maybe I can cover that in the presentation. Because um, because when I when I wrote the book. I really started to address two questions. I, I started out, my PhD goes back to 2003, I think I got the PhD, um, and I took a, a blend, kind of a combination of online and um, on, online and in-person PhD classes. We'd do one, one weekend on campus for three or four days, and then we'd have a, three, weeks, uh, three weeks of online classes. So I started 
getting involved with online then. I had an understanding in, in the uh, program chair's uh, office one day when he needed somebody to teach some online economics classes. All of a sudden, one day I was teaching online classes. I'd never done it before. Nobody had ever done it before. The technology wasn't really great back in about 2000. And as I've taught online for a variety of different colleges, and I started working with different people and putting online, there, there were particular classes online, I realized that what you need to be successful wasn't really clear. And so what I do is, is what I tend to do when I, when I find something that doesn't work. I do it once or twice the wrong way, and then I go out and look, look for a solution. And so sort of the solution is what, what this book is. So I started out saying, OK, how come this doesn't work? Let's see. They do it this way. They do it this way. This doesn't work. I don't like this. And I started talking to people. And then I made it a systematic process to go talk to people. So I started going out and talking. I went out and started talking to deans and um, professors who taught online. I wound up talking to business people who, had, who structured their own online classes to get a, to get a little bit of the background in it. Um, and what I found out in the process, some, some of the teaching frustrations that, that I heard as I, as I did the study, no student engagement. You know, it was really hard to get the students just involved in the class. Some were involved, but it was really hard to find them um, to get the students engaged. The second thing I found was a lot, of, a lot of online classes not set up right. They were kind of read-write classes. Read this, write about that. Read this, write about that. You know, there were no visuals, there were no videos. Um, you got to a structure where it wasn't engaging. You come into a classroom, you can put a video up, you can walk around, you can talk to people, you can see their faces. You give them, you can give people engaging team activities. In an online class, a lot of them are structured, read this, write that, read this, write that. It's, it's very blob. It's, it, it's the old correspondence course, just coming back to students. All we've done is, is change the technology. Um, the other thing it, it, that we noted is one of the frustrations is long videos. Um, people tend to, you know, create very, very long-running videos. It'll be recorded today. It'll probably be an hour-long video or something like that. That's a long sitting for a lot of people. You know, the, the, the average YouTube video is a couple minutes. Um, the other thing that people tended to do on, online is they record their lectures. Hey, it was a good classroom lecture. Let me record it and put it online, and that'll be the content for the week. Um, a couple of you mentioned discussion questions. One of the frustrations that I started to run into was factual discussion questions. And I particularly ran into this with some of the sort of um, colleges that had packaged programs. They put, they put together a factual discussion question, and they asked you the three items that the, the author mentioned in the readings for this week. And the first three people answered a question. And then there's another 20 <laughs> students looking for a unique answer. And there isn't a unique answer, because we've asked you a fact, not a, not a discussion question. Um, and the other element that I, I find really frustrating, and I don't know w w what your experience has been here, but it's the missing students. You know, students who, if I don't show up for your class at night, you know I'm not here. You know there's supposed to be 20 bodies in the room, there's only 19. You know somebody's missing, you can check off who they are. Um, in an online class, because of the way you participate, you're never sure when, if somebody's really missing or if they're just a late participant. You know, class ends Sunday night. I always participate Sunday night because I work Saturday night or something. Um, so th those are some of the things that, that set me off in terms of uh, what works and what doesn't work in an online class. Um, in terms of programs themselves, um, a lot of online programs are canned. That means the college has created the content, and they pop it out into the class. And there it sits, and everyone who teaches that class uses that content. Whether it's good content or not, they, they use it. Whether it's structured well or not, they use it. Which leads to the second problem that, that I found in a lot of online programs, out-of-date material. No one's updating the material, the uh, sort of in a set it and forget it mode. A um, couple things. Another, another item that was mentioned here, the learning management systems. You know, they're not necessarily the most robust. robust. Uh, some are better than others. I'll talk about that a little bit. But the, the learning management system has a big impact on the ability to put that class together. Um, you know, those of you who teach online, what happens when the student can't work the technology? You get an email from the student saying, hey, the software's <coughs> down. Hey, I don't have this. Hey, I couldn't get on the system tonight. You know, and they're looking at the professor as the technology support person rather than the technology support rather than the technology support people, all of a sudden, not only are you the instructor, you're also the uh, Windows PC 
um, version 7 guru or something like that, which is really tough to do. Um, there's, you also find instances where there's really no student support. If the students can't, you know, you, it's, hard to, it's hard to keep tabs as instructor on the students. And if you've got a lot of, um, if you've got a lot of students running through the process, then you, you need a mechanism to support them. And the big one that, that I, I found is really interesting, um, but I found it with a lot of um, online programs. It's sort of the purview of the adjunct instructor anyway, and they hire the instructor at the last minute. Hi, we got a class. It's it'll it's Monday now. Hi, we got a class starting mm -hmm. next Monday. Would you like to take? Would you like to teach this class for us? You know, and and oh by the way, we'll have we'll have the bookstore FedEx the, the textbooks to you and stuff like that. By the time that class opens, you're no more prepared for it than the students are. So those are some of the things that I sort of found in the review, um, and hence I said, well, how am I going to fix that? You know, what 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 will we do? to solve that problem. How am I going to take that? And that's hopefully what I, I published in the book. So I went out and I started looking at the literature around online teaching. And there's a bunch of research. Some of it's, it's a lot more now than it was when I started researching it for the book. Um, but I went out and I interviewed professors who were teaching online, online course designers, program administrators. I talked to some really good program administrators. Um, I talked to a bunch of students. I just interviewed a bunch of students about what their experience was taking an online class because it turned out they were actually a really good judge of what was going on. They, they know. They know what a good and bad class is, it turns out. Um, and then I wound up as a surprise talking to a whole bunch of people who were online kind of course providers. And I talked to people, some of whom was kind of funky online classes, how to renew your you know, real estate license in Nevada and you know, get your gun permit in Oklahoma and things like that. Um, but there's some really some people who are doing some really interesting things around commercial courses. So I sort of said, well, I probably should look there as well for part of the consulting. Um, so what I did was come up with kind of a list of 10 things that an online course that you need for the success of an online course. Um, and, and the key things turned out to be, as I started out, it's the course design and it's the instructor's facilitation. Those are the same things that make you successful in a traditional classroom. And what turned out, and I was thinking it was going to be all about technology and things like that. You know, if we have all this technology and I can integrate the videos and we bring all these cool things together. Remember, I was writing this book a couple years ago when those MOOCs started to get really popular. We thought we were all going to, you know, be replaced by one Stanford professor or something. Um, and it turns out that the technology was totally secondary. You can, put a good, you can put a good online class together with a very, very simple learning management system. You can put a good online class together with a very sophisticated online manage, learning management system. You can put a very bad class together with a really good learning management system. Um, it's really the course design and um, how the, the instructor facilitates that. Now, one of the things um, somebody mentioned earlier, online classes take a lot of time. Anybody want to venture a guess as to how long it takes, how much longer it takes to set up an online class versus a, an on-ground class? Twice as long. Twice as long? Any other thoughts? What? I would say it's actually setting it up and doing it, the work in Blackboard is probably less time than doing it in the classroom, but the prep work is probably three times as long. Three times as long to set it up in front. Okay. Part of the data actually is, and this is what I thought was really interesting, four to ten times as long to set it up, and the same amount of time to work it. The same amount of time to instruct it. When you that, say same amount of time to instruct it, same as in class? Or, well, same as in or class. same as for preparation? Sa same as in class. So, so if you're setting up, well, if you think about it, when you, you know, if, if I gave you a class tonight, and you said, well, you know, an experienced instructor, and okay, I gotta go talk about something tonight, you can probably go back to your desk this afternoon and say, oh, it's two o'clock, I can have a class ready for five. But if you know the subject matter, you can have a class ready for five, I'll just pick up these points, I'll prepare my lecture, things like that. You can put it together pretty quickly, and you can go in, and Ryan will tell you when, when he had me as instructor, my notes always came out, I don't know if he ever looked, but my notes would always come in, they were scratched on a piece of paper. Tonight's, tonight's content is scratched on a piece of paper, I know exactly what I'm going to do, but I've very done it very, very informally. I've scratched it out on a piece of, of, of loose leaf paper, in effect, and said those are my notes for tonight. 
So that's a quick way to set it up because you know what you're going to do. When you, when you set that online class up, you have to say, OK, well, what do I want to include here? Well, we've got this reading. We've got to make sure that reading's out here. I'm going to show these two videos in class. We've got to make sure those two videos are out there. I've got to go out to, I've got to, go out to YouTube or wherever it is, pull those videos back, put the link in, pop them into Blackboard. You're setting it up in Blackboard. You've got expiration dates. You've got uh, start and stop dates. You've got all sorts of characteristics on how the thing appears. It takes time. It takes time to put that together. So if you had to put together t this week's session, between 2 and 5 tonight, you probably couldn't do it. You probably couldn't do it very well. You, you'd probably scramble to put it together. You'd, you'd probably have some students who couldn't follow the instructions and would wind up lost, and they'd be the ones calling you on the phone saying, I can't find my, um, you know, what was I supposed to do this week, that type of thing. The data says it's 4 to 10 times as long to set up one of those classes. I thought that was a little bit on the high side, but it's clearly a couple times longer than setting up a regular class. In terms of the facilitation time, it's about the same because what you spend, you know, you spend the same amount of time grading papers and grading quizzes and things like that. But the time that you normally would spend in the classroom, you spend doing other things. You spend talking to students who don't understand things, who, who need some specific time. You might be running a WebEx or something like that in there, so you spend time kind of that an hour or so hopefully talking to some students during a WebEx, which is the same thing as the, the classroom time you spend. Um, you're going to spend time in the discussion forums, if you've got them working right, talking to the students in the discussion forums. So you're spending at least as much time running the class, plus all that initial setup time. Now, some places you know, defer, I don't know if you have course designers here, some people defer the course design to the course design people. Um, but even so, the instructor, they, they, you still have to spend that time setting that up, because you don't have course designers for your regular classes. By the instructors, I'm assuming design those classes. So it's really getting that class design set up and putting in that upfront effort. And then the next piece of it is, is um, the facilitation piece. If you're facilitating a class, just like you, you would facilitate a class that you, you know, the, the Thursday night class you, you normally teach, you come in and you show up for your two hours or your three hours or whatever it is, and you, you, you actively engage that class, you actively engage for those couple hours doing the class, you have to actually be engaged as the instructor in that online class. Um, I know I teach online, and I can tell you the week goes by. I've, had, I've been shoveling snow for every other day for the last two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is. And I can tell you that I can lose a day or two really quickly in an online class simply because I'm out in the driveway shoveling snow. And all of a sudden, that day is going by, and students, this, you know, students from someplace else have posted or something like that. Um, so it's important that the instructor actually spend that time facilitating. Um, now, when I talk about course design, one of the things that I found was really, really important, and I, I heard this. I've heard this a couple of places. I heard it primarily from Saul Khan, um, you know, Khan Academy, who spoke at a conference last year. But he said it very well, and it came out in my research as well. But he said, make the, make the classroom a welcoming place. You know, he's, he's structuring some classes now for universities and various programs. And what he's trying to do is make, those, make everything as welcoming as possible. Because when you come into a classroom like this, it's really easy to be welcoming. You know, you can stand, there, stand at the doorway and say hello to everybody. You can, you know, you can greet everybody. Everybody's kind of in a friendly mood when they come in. When you come into an online classroom, you're intimidated. You're absolutely intimidated. And what you want to do is make sure it's a welcoming place for the students. You want to make sure it's designed in some way that's easy for them to, to, to navigate in a supportive way. Um, you give them something easy to do to start off. How many people start off their online classes with just a basic introduction? Yeah. Right? Start off with a basic introduction, what do you do? The student has just had success doing something. The professor comes back into that basic introduction and says, welcome Jane, welcome Mary, welcome Bob, something like that. It immediately brings that student in and makes them feel comfortable. It doesn't make them feel ignored. It, makes, it brings them in. Um, you want to structure it in such a way that it looks, it's welcoming, there's instructions all over the place. I, um, one of the commercial people I, I interviewed said they have their website has a big green button that says start here. Um, 
And that's kind of what you want in an online class, is you want some place where I pop up the page. Anybody ever gone to a web, a web page where you can't figure out what it's about? You know, you open the web page, and what does it mean? What does it do? How do I do anything? Next thing you do is close it. If that's your online class, that's not good. So you want something in your online class that says, start here. You know, I, I, I usually start them with a big kind of bold welcome, welcome sections, you know, start here, send them a map, an email or a, an announcement that says, hey, start here. You know, and then it's usually followed by this written stuff, and then it's usually followed by a video of me. Um, and, and um, you know, picture me f filming a video sort of in my, um, my office, but that's what I do. Um, and at different times, I actually play around with it. Sometimes I have a green screen I put behind me, so I sometimes lay different pictures behind me. So we'll be on the beach, or we'll be on a, in some, you know, we'll be at the Empire State Building on a beach. I had a, I had a vision of Manhattan, like I was standing on a street corner of Manhattan I used for a little bit. It's a little complicated to produce, but they're kind of cool to, to offset the students. Um, so you want to set it up in a way that's, that's kind of engaging. The next thing you want is the, is the system to be set up in such a way that it's really clear to the students what the structure is. You know, the, the worst thing you can do is have a structure, your students come into an online classroom and have no idea what they're looking at. You know, if you have a module structure, you have a, um, I, I tend to use mod, a weekly module structures of some type, but you want the student to be able to say, okay, it's, it's you know, February 16th, that we're in module one, February 16th goes from, you know, it go, uh, module one goes from February 16th to February 22nd, and this is the, this is the way it's structured. And it kind of becomes a discrete unit so people understand um, people understand the different pieces. You use Blackboard. Blackboard doesn't have, as far as I know, doesn't allow you to put headers in the middle of a module. It lets you set, sets up weekly activities beautifully, but what it doesn't do is let you put headers in there. There's no header function in Blackboard. Um, so I tend to do something like with Blackboard, I just tend to take some big bold, I create a big bold page basically that says assignments and content and questions for the professor this week. Just something so when you jump into the thing, you know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so the assignments aren't blended in or something. Um, so you're able to look very concisely at what's going on there. You know, this is kind of, this is part A, this is content, part B is the assignments, part C is the discussions, something like that that you can see very, very clearly. So the students can see it, they're not hunting for what's due for that week. You know, you don't want all the assignments over here, you don't want all the content over here. <coughs> you want it structured in such a way that it's entirely self-contained. Um, if, if you think of actually how the successful web people do with Amazon, it's all self-contained on a page. Right? They're not jumping around a bunch of pages, it's all, it's all self-contained. Um, consistency. Does the college here have, um, like, uh, re reviewers of your online classes? Is there, do they look for a standard setup within Blackboard or within the program? Just give you a little feedback. Um, Blackboard has a college template in every course, mm -hmm. and it has a getting started here, and it has a course right. content, and it has some of the layout that you're talking about. Um, then faculty are kind of on their own to develop what they need to develop. Right. Um, we also have modules, and I have some faculty who use folders versus some who have modules, and in the modules we will use folders to create those headers. Right. So right. It's, it, it varies. It varies. Right, and, and, and the point is actually, if I get in my car, and you know, I'm, I'm going to Florida next week, hopefully, right? And I'm gonna get, a, I'm gonna get off the plane and I'm gonna go over and get in a rental car. And I probably will never have seen a rental car before, but I'm gonna give them my credit card and my driver's license, and they're gonna give me the keys, and I'm gonna walk out in the parking lot and get the rental car. And there's a pretty good chance that I'll know how to drive that car, because the gas pedal's in the same place, the steering wheel's, the steering wheel's in the same place, the radio buttons are in the same place, the, that the lights will generally be in the same place. Um, it, has a, it has a look and feel that I'm familiar with. If I got into the car and it had a joystick, one had a joystick, the other one had knobs, the, you know, something else had the gas pedal on the floor, I, I, I worked one gas pedal with you know, my, my, my thumb, something like that, it would be really difficult to, to understand what I was doing. Um, so so what, what I recommend is that you have a consistent look and feel of the classes that fits, that 
so the students know where they are. So if I'm a student and I take the first class, I take the second class, I take the third class, I don't have to relearn structure every time I take a class. You know, it's, it's, it looks the same each time I take a class. I've cut my learning curve rather dramatically. It's like getting in the driver's seat of a car. It feels very familiar after the first, the first time you got in the driver's seat of a car, it felt weird. Right? For years, you've probably been in the back seat of mom and dad's car. And one day you got in the driver's seat of your own car and all of a sudden you really got the power to steering wheel. It felt weird for the first couple times. But, it's, but it becomes second nature to you to do that. That's kind of what you want to do with your classes, is make them as consistent as possible across your program or across your college. I mean, usually it's program specific. Um, but you want it, you want it um, in a consistent way so the students don't have to look all over the place to figure out what's going on. It looks just like last time. Yes? Why? Why, why is it so great that a student is so familiar that it looks like everything else? Isn't, isn't um, I can see you don't want to blow the student's mind and they're totally confused and they're going to run away. Well, I think that's, that's the answer. You don't want to blow the student's mind. But you risk some sort of, uh, you know, boring quality if they're all the same. When, isn't it, if you got into a Ferrari and the gas pedal was in a different place, you learn where it was. You'd be really yeah. happy with that car, and you wouldn't want to. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't I, I, what I what I don't mean. I, I think what I'm trying to say is you don't want you don't want to lose a lot of time to the student looking for. You don't want the student to have to spend the first two weeks of class figuring out what's going on. You know, well, that's the, different. I'm not trying to be yeah, yeah. troublesome, but that's different than having some sort of uniform thing across the top. Well, I'm not saying. I'm saying same look and feel. I'm not, the definition of look and feel, I'll do videos, you won't do videos, I'll have exercises, you'll do, you know, case study problems, something like that. That, that type of thing is kind of instructive specific. I'm just sort of talking about a general template where it kind of all looks the same. You know, Brian, I'll ask you a question. Albertus is, um, when you got your master's degree, all those classes, as far as I know, look the same. Yeah. Right, you got on each week. Exactly the same. They look exactly the same. So you could tell where you were each week, right? Um, I use that as, that as an example, because so, they, they did put money into that, you know, making it look that way. Yeah, everything was different once you got inside, but it sort of looked the same. That's, that's all I'm saying. I mean, yes, it's a fine trade-off. What you don't want is the students lost. I guess my point is, well, you know, the worst thing you can have is the students lost when they get into the class, right? Um, you know, I, I use, I mean, probably everybody here uses Amazon at some point in time. You get on Amazon, it always looks the same. Right? There's a picture of a product, there's a description, there's a buy here button, the reviews are at the bottom. Looks the same. I also use census data a lot. And I can tell you, every time I get on a census website, every time I get on a census website, they redesigned it. Okay, if I, don't, if I haven't been on it in two months, they've redesigned it. And I say, okay, now where was this that I got a couple months ago? I just need this for another <coughs> town or something like that. And it's really hard to follow because they constantly redo the thing. That, that's kind of my point about same look and feel. Yeah, it, it's, yes, there's a trade-off with that. Um, the, the other thing I want to stress with um, the program, the, co the course structure itself, try to align it with the flexibility you offer the students if you're offering an online program. Lots of people say, oh, we've got an online program, you know, work at your own pace, you know, work, at, work on your own schedule, and then they get into the program and discover, well, wait a minute, it's not really my own pace. You know, I have a deliverable every Sunday um, or every Monday. Oh, I have to post with these certain time frames and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're aligning what you're selling with what you're actually delivering. One of the complaints I heard from the students was, was they'd say, well, they say work at your own pace, but it's not your own pace because, you know, you're a college and you're on a semester. Right? You're on an eight-week semester, or you're on a six-week semester, or a six-week course sequence, or in a 15-week course sequence. So you want to make sure that you align what you're marketing with what you're actually delivering. And that's tough, by the way, because, you know, I, you know, I'd like to work at my own pace, but my own pace is, I'd like to do everything tomorrow, and somebody else's own pace is, well, I think I'll get to it eventually, mm -hmm. and maybe a few months out I'll get to that. And by the way, the college is saying, I got 15 weeks to do this. There must be a trade-off here, too. I mean, there's a balance because uh, if you go too far in the direction of learn at your own pace, then you're back to the correspondence course model. Right. And you can't have those class discussions. You can't have everybody's, at, everybody's at a different right. place. So it's you and the student, you and 25 or 35 students 
one on one. Right, and you, right, and that, that that becomes really hard to moderate. Plus, you don't have a discussion. Right, we yeah. can't all, you know, if, if I was trying to do this lecture at your convenience, so I'd have to, I'd do it twenty times, because you each one come in, you know, one time, which would be silly. Yeah, there, yeah, there is a trade off. Somewhere in between, I would think you'd have some certain amount of flexibility, but also you have to have deadlines. You have to have deadlines. Yeah, one of the things, that, and, and, and a good example of that. Um, is, you know, things like posting requirements in an online class. Well, um, one of the things, I it's probably in here a little bit later, but one of the things that, that, that is really important is that you get the students into a, a posting requirement pattern that works for them and works for you. So if, I, if you don't think about it, you'll do something like, say, the class runs, a typical online class run. When, when do your online classes run? Monday to Sunday? A good example? Right? Okay. So they run Monday to Sunday. So the class opens on Monday, and no posts on Monday, no posts on Tuesday, no posts, no posts, no posts. And um, you know, by you know Sunday afternoon, there's two posts, and they do by midnight Sunday. And you know, hey, look, nine o'clock, a couple posts, and then you come in the next morning, and there's a whole string of posts because everybody posted between you know 8:45 and midnight on Sunday. But that wasn't a conversation. Okay, that really wasn't, it wasn't, and even if it was a conversation, it wasn't a conversation that included me as the instructor because, quite frankly, the instructor's probably not going to be working at 10 o'clock on Sunday night. And it shouldn't be. Right? So, but that's a typical pattern if you let somebody do that. Well, you can back it up and say, well, wait a minute. Now, how can I structure that in a different way that'll, that'll make it more viable? So I say things like post early in the week, and then you can finish the week, but you give them two deadlines during the week. The system doesn't support it. In most case, Blackboard doesn't support it. But you can you know, put the requirement out there. So post early in the week. Right? And say, OK, post by Friday, and then you can finish up your discussions on um, Sunday or something like that. So you've given them two deadlines. You've given them one that works for you, which is sort of Friday, so you have an opportunity to deal with it. And you've given them Sunday, which is an opportunity for them to deal with it. But what you also want to do is make sure that the class is open for the students in some reasonable period of time. So if you're doing a weekly class, I assume students here work, potentially. Lots of them probably work. You know, if we're thinking they're on a traditional 9 to 5 schedule, they're not, right? They got kids, they got child care, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So they work at odd hours. They're going to work on your class at odd hours. So what you want to do is say, well, I can't open the class on Monday morning and expect them to finish it on Sunday night because that's convenient. You want to do something where you open the class earlier. Two of them maybe you open it the week, week before, a week and a half before, something like that, where you give them an opportunity for the early birds to work on it when they can work on it, the late birds to work on it when they can work on it. You give everybody who's got these different job schedules the opportunity to work on it in a in a time frame that suits their needs. Right? So if, if you have a class open, on, so, so module, module might open Friday and close the following Sunday, so it's open 10, 11 days, something like that. It gives the opportunity for the student to read, well, I only do my work on the weekends. OK, the, both the module's open on a weekend. Read it, read it the weekend. That way you can participate during the week. Something like that, where you've given them flexibility to, 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 to have their life but yet join you in a discussion and put, put restrictions on the discussion so they have to join you once in a while. And if you give them something to do in a discussion that gives them the opportunity to participate as a, as a discussion, not as a recitation of facts. That's the hard part. I'm just going to talk about that. That's one of my other uh, bullets here. But you want to give them something that gives them an opportunity, at least something that's easy to jump in for that week. You know, give me your impression of the reading. Give me your impression of the video. Give me your reaction to this particular article, something like that. Something that doesn't require a lot. Because if I get them going early in the week, then they're in. OK? If it's just two or three discussion questions, some more technical, some more complicated, or a problem or something, get them going early. Give them something that they can, you know, give them something that they can accomplish first thing in the week. Watch, hey, watch this video. What do you think of it? Something like that. Um, yeah, it isn't a great discussion question, but it gets the student going, and therefore they'll progress to questions two and three or something like that. That's what I mean. Just, when I say mark the flexibility, just give them you know, options around the side that fits their schedule.
Because that's the hard part. You know, if, if you're designing a class for the traditional student, you're probably not teaching that traditional student. That's not the guy that's taking the online class. Um, other comments, let's see. Um, online course content. The one thing that came out loud and clear was online course content. That, the students jumped all over online course content that was repurposed from an on-ground class. You know, the lecture, you recorded your lecture, they knew it. They said that wasn't for us. Um, they looked at exercises that weren't specific for online. You know, now break up into your teams and you know, go solve this problem for half an hour or something. They, they knew. Um, so what you want to do is make sure that you're pulling content that's specific to online. It can be used best in online. And it may be more videos or, or something like that. It may be smaller videos that you create. Um, one of the things about a video is, uh, well, what, there's another question back to the, to the group. What, um, what's the attention span for a video? What's your attention span for a video? What does the research say? Less than five minutes. Less than five minutes. Um, any other thoughts? Two. Two? Mm -hmm. I said like, I think I said seven to ten in the book and then the research came out and said it was five. The attention span is five minutes. If you get, if, you know, if you click on a personal YouTube video and it says it's going to run for 45 minutes, unless somebody assigned it to you, you're not watching it. Right? You're not watching it. Unless you really want to watch it. Okay? Um, you don't have 45 minutes. So you want a two-minute video, a three-minute video, a five-minute video, something like that. Um, that's what I mean when I say curated for online. You know, the lecture you're giving is normally, you know, lecture in front of a classroom, you're lecturing for, you know, you get a two-hour class, you're probably going to lecture for an hour of it or something. That's too long for the student. You want to break that up into a series of manageable bites, something that they can, you know, watch a couple times, then do something, watch some more, do something. Um, where well, you're not asking them to watch 40, 45 minutes or an hour of a video at a sitting. They won't do it. The video has to be in a short piece. Um, actually, there's a new product I discovered, Jing. I don't know if anybody uses TextMix product, Jing, where you can just, it has a five minute limit on a video, which for people like me is great, because I can't go more than five minutes. I can just, you know, I do a little screen capture and I can't go more than five minutes, and it, it loads really nicely. Um, so it, it, it's a type, it, it, it actually works really well. But the idea is you want your video, you, you know, you want to create content specifically for that class. That gets you away from that read-write mode. Right? Normally, what you might do is you ask a student to you know, write a paper, and then you can talk about it in class, or you talk about it before you, you, you have them write the paper. That's, that's, that's nice. But what you want to do is create content that supports that for the classroom. So, so what you want the student to do, and this is the engagement question, you want the students to engage with the content in the class. You want them to touch it. Okay? But what do students do you know, normally on their computers? You know, they've all got something. They've all got a smartphone or something. What are they doing with it? Surfing. Surfing. Facebook. Yeah, checking Facebook. Yeah, we haven't got the we haven't got the um, we haven't got the forums yet to work like Facebook. You know, Facebook tells you what the most important feeds are, and it keeps putting them on the top of your list. The the, the learning management systems aren't there yet, um, but they also do things like play games. You know, they'll go play whatever. You know, whatever the current whatever the current game is. So you want to give them things to do. Well, back to Facebook. Why do we go back? To, why do Why do people chase chase Facebook all the time? New content every five minutes. Somebody's you know, if you're a Facebook friend, somebody's always posting something. Right? There's always content. It's like Twitter, Facebook. There's always content coming through there. The news feed. There's always something coming through there. So you want you want to give the students that to engage them which means things like problems, exercises, um, active assignments. So one, one of the suggestions that, that, that somebody suggested, you, you know, go off and uh, one of the big ones is go find an article, go find a video, go find something that supports this particular point. You go off and find this and come back and tell us about it. Um, I had somebody tell me, um, hey, I teach an art class. I can't take you to a museum, but go take the virtual tour of this museum from this website and go through room, you know, the, the impressionist room, and then come back and let's talk about the impressionist room. I sent you to do something, now you get to talk about what you did. It's like we took a field trip even though we did it virtually. 
Um, let's solve a problem. Okay, well, here's the first part of the problem. Oh, by the way, we got till Wednesday to solve the first part of the problem, then we'll progress on to the, you know, the second part of the problem through, through the rest of the week, the third part of the problem. Um, but you want the students to actually give them something new. One of the things I do in discussion forums, I like to do in discussion forums, is give them part B of the question, part C of the question throughout the week. So if you've posted early, there's a follow-up question that goes with that discussion forum. It's not just, it doesn't just die. You know, if you get in, you know, that's, that's why I wanted to post early. So I guess I have something to react to. Um, but I give them a question on Saturday morning because they all post it. It doesn't matter what time you give them the deadline. They're all, they're all gonna be right before the deadline. But the next day you go back in and you give them a follow-up, you give them a follow-up question. Or you give them some synopsis of what you saw and ask them a follow-up question. It gives them a reason to come back. If they're expecting that, it gives them a reason to come back. What you're trying to do with your exercises and your content is specifically designed for the online course, and you want to give them a reason to come back. Do something. Touch, feel, apply. You know, get in there and deal with it. Don't just ask a question and go away. Kind of ask a question, follow up the question, give them, you know, put an activity in there. Um, the other thing about the discussion forums, and this is, um, I think really important. Um, how, how do you start, how, people use this discussion questions? Are, are, does the college have rules about how you participate in the discussions? You know, how do you instructors participate? Okay. Set yes. up by the instructor. Set up by the instructor. The instructor has their own rules. They, they do it. Because you, you see lots of them where, um, and not so many anymore, but there's lots of them where the, you know, there'll be a program requirement you respond to each student. And then and somebody will set it up with a technical question. And I don't know, I, I find it hard to be witty after about the third or fourth student, okay? Um, but if you ask a good question, and you're not required to respond to each student, you can kind of respond to categories of students. You know, okay, all of you guys who said, you know, the, the, the company should do this, what have you considered this particular element, or what would you do if the wages changed this way? And all of you who said this, what would, you, what would happen if you, you had this event? So, so what the instructor's doing, really, is kind of the same thing they would do in the classroom. They're moderating the discussion, they're trying to take it, they're trying to take this discussion which is going all over the place, and they're trying to bring it back to the central theme. Um, but, but the role is a little bit different. Is, is that they're really out there as a moderator, they're out there as the guide, they're out there as the questioner, and they're out there as the cheerleader. You know, they're out there trying to encourage the student. Remember, you want a welcoming place so they come in. You want to make sure that you know which students aren't playing, you know, so you can try to bring them in. You know, so you can kind of respond. I tend to try to respond to different students, each, not different students, but different, you know, different blocks of students each week, just so that that same the student doesn't feel left out. Um, comments tend to be encouraging. You know, yes, you can do this, or that shouldn't be a problem. Have you considered doing it this way? But you really want to, you not only have to have the discussion, you have to be the support person, kind of like the emotional support that, that goes with it. Um, you know, discussion question concepts. Um, apply concepts, conduct research, go find something, go do something, analyze a project, um, reflect, hey, what do you think about this particular reading? What, did, you know, what was relevant to you as you did this? The key thing, and discussion questions are terrible when they ask you to recite facts. They are just terrible to re when, when you're asked to decide, recite facts. Because the first three students recite the, you know, the guy on Monday morning recites the facts and that's it. Um, the, the other thing you can do with discussion questions, and, and does Blackboard do this, where well, you can lock the questions until you respond? So you force the students to? Yes, you force it to post. I have to post, I have to post before I can see the answer. Yeah, and that kills groupthink. You know, if I, if I start asking a question and everybody else says, you know, the, the answer is blue, pretty soon it doesn't matter if you haven't responded yet, you pretty much think the answer is blue. Um, even if you thought it was orange. And, and, if you lie, and if you set up the questions in such a way that I can't see your responses until I post, I'm much more likely to post something that's a different answer. I'm, I'm much more likely to express my own opinion. And that's one of the other things that the, the research showed um, for online classes. 
the introverts come out. In, an, in, a, in a traditional classroom, you know, there's half a dozen dominant people. And they answer all the questions, and they're usually the A students. Um, but they're really dominant. And, and you can sit in that classroom for six months and never say a word. In an online classroom, you can't. You are forced to express your opinion, or else you don't get a grade for the assignment, um, which, is really, which is really good. And you can bring, if, if you structure the questions in such a way, and I, I structure many of many of my questions so you can't respond until you, you can't see everybody else until you, um, until you respond, you get everybody's opinion. You get that diversity of opinion. Um, and the key thing, you know, is, is again that those discussion questions ask for some sort of opinion, ask you to do something, ask you to do something such that if I've got 20 students in the class, I really can get 20 different answers. If I ask what, you know, what, what the author said on page 10, I'm going to get one answer. And that's not good. Um, about discussion questions, first time you do the class, 20, about 50% of the discussion questions are going to be good. Second time you do the class, about 80% of them are going to be good. I don't think you'll ever get up to 100% of them being good. But most of them, you know, if you structure them right, I think they tend, they, you tend to improve them over time. Um, and, and the other thing with discussion questions, uh, doing a class now that somebody else set up, multiple, you know, multiple questions in a discussion question, the student never knows what they're answering. You know, if you've got two or three topics, make it two or three questions, or make the second question a follow-up or something like that. But ask them a simple one-sentence question. Ask them something that's really exact. Don't ask them, well, what about this and this and this and this and this, because then they don't know what they're answering. If I ask the class four questions at the same time, they won't know which one they're answering. So a um, big thing on discussion questions. So how do you get, you know, quite the point was raised earlier, how do you get, how do you get value out of discussion questions? That's where, that's where the time goes in in the setup. I mean, it, it's setting that up. If I ask a bad question in front of the classroom, I can immediately change the question. Immediately change the question. If I ask a bad question in the discussion forums, I don't know if it's a bad question until Wednesday. And by Wednesday, it's too late because three people already posted. Right? And you say, okay, well, I'll put a clarifying question out or something. So it's really the question of the time spent in that part of setting it up. That's a lot of where your extra time comes in, in just making sure you're asking the question right and testing it and changing it next time. Blackboard doesn't do this, but, but Canvas as a learning management system has a, um, they call it a publish fun function, so you can put a page up. And, and if you don't publish it, the students never see it. And one of the great things about it is, you know, you, I, you just go through, hey, I just went through week six and discussion questions three and four are bad. And so you just put a page up really quickly and it says, hey, for next year, fix up discussion questions three and four. They should be this. And you just post it in the, in the, um, in the, in the thing as a note. You know, so I'll see it next year when it comes time to do the class. But uh, the students will never see it. Nobody else will ever see it other than the course designers. But it's just a kind of a nice way to keep a running tab of what went wrong. The same thing you might write on your, your, your script notes for the class. And this is new. You can hide it and hide. You can hide, you can hide, no, you can, you, you actually can, sure, you can unhide it, right. Yeah, Canvas is actually cool, cool because it's a little thing, it, it shows up on a screen as, um, it shows up as a, a gray cloud versus I think a red cloud or green cloud or something, so it, it does have, it's, I like it better, but you're right, you can do that by hiding and unhiding. Um, it's, it's somehow, it doesn't seem as natural in Blackboard to me, I don't know why. Um, yeah, the other thing, this is a big one too. This came up, and this is one of the things that originally prompted me to, to, to work on this. Care and feeding. Online classes need regular care and feeding. If you're teaching a, a regular class, you can come into that class tonight and you can talk about whatever happened during the day. You can talk about whatever was on it, you know, whatever was in the newspaper this morning whatever the president said in his speech last night. You can bring all of that right into the classroom. You can talk about the latest research. You can just bring it in, you don't have to do anything, you just, like me, you just clip an article. I still clip articles, I still have newspapers. I'm old, I have newspapers. Um, but I can clip an article from the newspaper, drop it on the desk and say, okay, I'm gonna mind me to talk about this during class. With an online class, you can't do that. You, you know, they tend to get built, but it takes four to 10 times as long to build them you build them. 
do you want to do that effort again? No. Okay, well, I didn't do that last year. I didn't do it the year before. I didn't do it the year after that. All of a sudden, you've got a class that's three and four years old. You'll update it if there's a new textbook. You might not update it for new technology. Right? I mentioned Jing earlier. I didn't know about Jing other than you know, six months ago or something. Right? So it's, new, it's relatively new technology. Um, you know, a few years ago, you wouldn't put videos in your class because people didn't have iPhones that could upload the stuff quickly to, um, to, to YouTube or something like that. Um, you still see classes a lot where, where people don't do that. I, I, did a, I did a class where I included Twitter as one of the current event assignments. Hey, we're all going to talk about um, current events in Twitter. Okay, I put the, you know, put the class hashtag for the class. Um, how do you think that went, by the way? Anybody have any, any ideas how that went? Uh, well, it went really well, except it turns out Twitter has a spam filter. And if you post the same thing with the same, a similar thing with the same hashtag in sequence, like at 11.52, 11.54, and 11.57 at night, um, Twitter thinks they're spam, and they really are. Twitter thinks they're spam, and it spams them out so they don't get into anybody's feed. So I would, actually came to grading students and discovering, I can't see your tweets, and they said, oh no, I did them, and then I discovered it did what I wanted to do with the discussion forums, which was get rid of your spam. So it kind of, it kind of was interesting to, next time I do that, we'll have, we'll, we'll, I'm going to make them do it over three days, or five days, or something like that, so it doesn't happen. Um, but you know, a few years ago, you wouldn't have even thought to integrate Twitter into an account. If you're not updating that class, if you're not actively updating that class, it gets old really fast. Really fast. Ryan, that class, you know, the classes you took for me, they're now three years old. I know, I wrote them. Okay? They need, you know, I, I throw new stuff in them. I mean, but they need a, a revisit. That type of thing, because the technology has changed just enough that you can do some other stuff. I just, did, I just redid a bunch of them and threw some new parts in them. Um, it's, it's, it's really important that you keep those classes up to date because the students know a stale class. And if the students know a stale class, pretty soon, or your, they're your customers, pretty soon your customers know a stale class. If you get really stale, I don't know if you'd happen at a community college, but if you get really stale and you're, you're competing for students, like a lot of the MBA programs are at night or something like that, you're going to lose those students because your stuff isn't up to date and somebody else's is. Um, the other thing, uh, formal student support, faculty support process. Um, if you're teaching an online class, see, most of the online students are regular students here, sort of Hartford area students. Okay, so you don't have a distance you don't have a distance problem necessarily, but you probably still have a technology problem, right? You t Hi, I'm taking an online student. I graded a paper earlier this morning. Said, send me a Microsoft Word file. He says, I don't have Microsoft Word. Here's a G uh, a Gmail file, a, a Google file. Okay, now I got to go figure out how to open a Google file, um, or somebody has to figure out how to open a Google file. Fortunately, he was able to convert it back. Um, but you have these technology issues where the student doesn't have access to a laptop. The student doesn't have Wi-Fi at home. The student doesn't have, you know, the student is still running Windows XP. Your new system is designed only to run on Windows 7 and better. Hi, I'm working a Mac. Um, well, I'm sorry, our software doesn't support a Mac. Well, it needs to support a Mac because it's 25% of the market. So you get these technology issues which if you don't have a technology support system for your online students, and that means somebody to take that phone call at 10 o'clock on Sunday night, right? when a student can't get their paper to upload or something like that, the faculty become your technical support. And I'm, get, I'm guessing that many of you don't want to be technical support for Windows, Macs, servers, Oracle, and all of that stuff, because you don't know it either. Um, so you sort of have that, you know, you want to make sure you've got some support system for the, for the technology. You've got non-traditional students, so you don't know what their technology levels are. Um, you want to make sure your faculty understands what capabilities they have, what new things are available, something like this, I guess. You know, or how to use Jing, or how to, you know, integrate YouTube, or how to use Camtasia, or something like that, to, you know, to get your screen captures. You want to make sure your faculty understands what's going on. Um, 
So you need the technology support, you need, a phone, you need online support, you need a phone system, you need it off hours. And all of this boils down to, you know, what, what are they pushing on the college? What's, what's the big thing that, that everybody wants for the college now, for colleges now? Retention. So what happens if I have a missing student? They drop out, that's not good. What's, what happens to a student if they're not performing in an online class or any class? You want to kick them back to an academic advisor or something. You want, to, you want to send them someplace where you can work on retention. So in terms of support mechanisms, you want the technology support. Um, again, online tends to be the purview of adjuncts. Or it tends to be the purview of people, a lot of students I talk to take their non-core courses online. You know, you need that psychology course, that economics course, that English course, you take it online because you're in a nursing program. Something like that. You, you take the nursing programs in person, you take the, the distribution requirements online. The online instructor probably has no idea about that student. Doesn't know if they're a good student, doesn't know if they're a bad student, doesn't know what happened to them, doesn't know where they are. Um, if you go to some of the other colleges that use adjuncts extensively, they don't know anything about your program because they're hired to teach one class or two, you know, hired to teach something very specific, and they probably do it a lot of different places. So what you see is, if you don't have a formal student support process, I mean, the example I have in the book is, hi, I got two students who didn't show up. If you want me as the instructor to go chase them, I can, but I don't know their circumstances. If I as the instructor can take that and go back to somebody, a central point, and say, hey, you know, John and Mary haven't shown up for class so far this semester. Um, can you reach out to them and figure out what's going on? Because as a faculty, as an instructor, you probably have their email. As a faculty support person, you've probably got their phone number. You've got all sorts of stuff by which you can reach out to them that you don't necessarily share with faculty. Um, you can talk to their department head. You get somebody who isn't participating in the class, if I'm, if I'm the instructor and they don't participate in my class, I can push them, I can fail them, I can give them a good or bad grade, but they might be doing that in somebody else's class, they might have done that in the class before, they're probably going to do it in the next class. If you want to retain them and you actually want them to get a degree, a valuable degree, somebody needs to sit them down and, 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 and kind of figure out what's going on and get them, get them structured. You can't let the faculty do that. You can't, let the, the, you can't leave that to the instructors. If you're going to have too many online students, you've got to, have, you've got to hire that, that, that body, that support mechanism, something, to make, to make sure you get back to those students. Absolutely critical. Um, and I know I've been asked to do it, and it drives me, it drives me nuts. Um, a final item I wanted to talk about. One of the things that, that I really found, and it's my, fa my favorite quote here, um, it's a quote from Steve Jobs, and it says, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. And this came out loud and clear in, in, my, um, in my research. Everybody who was teaching online classes where the institutions were trying to put too much control over the product, you know, they were can it was all canned, it was all structured, you had to teach this. Um, you didn't let, the, what they didn't do was let the teachers teach. And I think the key element was to let the teachers teach. You hired them, and Steve Jobs says, we hired them because they're smart. We want, them to do, we want them to do their thing. And that's really important in an online program that you let the teachers run their class their way. That's, and that's back to the answer to the question over here earlier. Yeah, I don't want it. You know, you don't want to control them too much. You kind of want them in the same mold. You kind of want it to look like a car. But yeah, if you want to run a Ferrari and I want to run a Fiat, we, you know, we, we can both do that. Um, but it's really, really critical that you let the instructors control those classes. You may have to give them the support so they can control those classes, so they can build it right, particularly in, in, in the structuring stuff. You know, particularly in making sure they integrate the various technologies into the class. Um, and I think that, I think that pretty much concludes what I had prepared. Um, and I don't know, I'll be happy to take questions, comments, concerns, criticisms. Questions?
Yes. I just have a question about 10 minutes. And now when you can start, it's 10 minutes, so they use it the frame. But is 10 minutes enough to say everything you have to say? If not, how would you make what everyone would say in 10 minutes? Is it a technique and a big thing? Split it up. Split it up. Um, it just simply the fact of breaking up into, if you're teaching a, an interactive um, um, online class, you know, so, so, so we're doing, we did this as a webinar. What I would do, and I asked questions, I probably didn't ask enough, but I would ask questions every, there's about five or six different questions in an hour. So that's approximately one every 10 minutes, right? So what you would do is you might put a video out there, okay? And when, so the video runs for five minutes. Now you may have 20 minutes worth of content. You may have half an hour's worth of content, right? So you can do, it depends on how sophisticated you want to get. I mean, if you really want to get sophisticated, you, you give them five minutes of lecture, now try this. And you give them some exercise built into a, a, a learning management system where they got to attempt to do something. Not a quiz per se, now try this. Let's see how, how well you did. So if I was teaching a finance class, I might lecture on what a profit loss statement looked like and say, okay, now here's a bunch of numbers. Let's see if we can build a profit loss statement in the class would get engaged, right? So you could certainly build those exercises in. But simply the fact that the video stopped, right? The video stops. I now have to move my hand to the mouse and click video two. That gets my attention back. Because now I'm looking at video two, okay? And now I'm looking at video three, and now I'm looking at video four. So, so my half an hour lecture, even if it's split up into six videos interspersed with, you know, fun facts or something like that, or, or, or just something that, you know, it's complicated material. You come, I know this is complicated. You know, just you, you pop something up occasionally and say, look, I know this is confusing. Okay, so let me see if it, let me explain it. This, this one explains it differently than the last two videos or something like that. Um, it, it gets their attention. The trick is, don't let somebody watch something for 30 minutes. Because you want to interrupt somebody every few minutes so they have to move. Because as soon as they move, you drag your attention back to the computer screen. Okay? Um, I mean, that, that's kind of the idea. If, if, if you have unlimited funds and you can go use a lector or a storyline or something like that, you can you know, progress the whole course like it's an hour long sequence with exercises and stuff mixed in. That's the commercial application. I mean, that's what a corporate trainer would do, you know, if they had unlimited money to do it. Um, but in an online class, you can just bust it up occasionally by putting different pieces in there. Eh, it's, it's not fantastic, but it's, it, the idea is to break the guy's attention. <coughs> He's zoning out, you want, his, you want him back on your screen. Right? Other questions? No. Useful? Valuable? Well, okay. That's at least two. I got two, po I got two positive reviews, Ryan. Here we go. <laughs> so, thank, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.